Hello and welcome to the Skylanders Spires Adventure Developer Commentary. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to the senior character designer, Nat Lowe. So I guess I'll, um, I'll start by asking you, what were your roles on Skylanders Spires Adventure? Uh, specifically Spiral's Adventure? Um, I started... yeah, I'll start with, um, the original. Specifically for that one, I started out as a senior character designer. Uh, it was me, um, another designer, um, Jesse Moore. Where we were primarily the two character designers. Toby did some characters, but he pretty much by the end of the project was, you know, as the lead, he was just like, I'm busy, you guys finish these for me. And I believe uh, Adrian Leda worked a bit on those as well. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with all those names, but... Uh, so besides just me working on them, I did the, uh, the initial combat prototype with Dan Gerstein. We sort of had this early on in the development, there was this sort of... Uh, it was kind of like one of those game jams, but it was also sort of like this designer battle royale, like, whose idea is going to win out? And Dan and I worked on a sort of top-down fighting thing that, you know, essentially we went into it with uh, the mindset of doing Diablo for kids. And the other one that kind of had, a you know, a lot of popularity, and you could say the two of them sort of you know, we took a bit from each of the two, uh, Ray West, and I think he worked with John Barnes on his prototype, was more of a Lego style, you know, action RPG style type of prototype. But, uh, you know, we worked on those things and eventually kind of came up with the uh, first level of the game, which was, um, I forget the name of the levels, the one with the sky golem, though, or the, the golem. That was like hmm. the very first prototype level that we had for a while. Stone Town, I think. Okay, yeah. So, you know, I I started out um, working with the ma the four major characters that we would show in our demos, which was Spyro in the very beginning. It was just like a weird red dragon. I think you've seen that toy before. But he eventually turned into Spyro, and we had... Um, um, Bash the Rock Dragon. I'm remembering remembering other development names. Then we also had uh, if, what eventually became Zap, which was a Cyclops slime, and uh, Boomer. Uh, that was back when he was like an old grouchy troll with what we had affectionately called beard pants. Because <laughs> his beard straight into his legs, and we were like, mm, okay, beard pants. So, and, and, and then I guess just to cover all the other, like, I mean, that's how I started the project. I eventually would work on other things, like I had to work on all the magic items. I worked on, uh, I did a lot of the PvP work in the beginning. Uh, eventually, we had Earl Otis kind of take over PvP, just because there was just, my hands was in too many things, and I did uh, magic items, did, uh, and as you noted, I did the credits as well. Yes. Um... We'll talk about the credits in a bit, but uh, with regards to uh, other Skylanders, you were in charge of uh, designing, obviously, Spyro and many other um, Skylanders, which sort of became synonymous with the, the name of um, uh, the series. Um, yeah. Uh, was it quite challenging to create so many different uh, characters um, and, and so many uh, different movesets with within all of that? Um, in the beginning, I don't... I think the biggest challenge in the beginning was really figuring out where we wanted to take everything. What, like, what was essentially the DNA of, of Skylanders? What was that going to be? And, like, another thing I worked on was, like, the sort of upgrade system we had. Uh, I definitely wanted to do more with the upgrades, but um, given that we had so many characters, what we ended up going with was roughly what we determined in to be like, okay, this is a feasible amount of work that we can do. Um, but I don't, I didn't really, I didn't really find it that hard. Like maybe it's just the field I'm in, but coming up with ideas, um, I think the trickiest parts were learning what works best for the game. So for example, I think like I originally worked on Prison Break and I was really desiring to give him a different feel of like 
Like, I just wanted him to feel different, and I had this kind of weird beam attack that kind of was not shooting in front of you, and it was really hard to use. And it, you know, took a lot of feedback before we were like, you know what, this just isn't working for what the game needs, and and that changed quite a bit. Uh, and then eventually we just. Uh, just to give it well, a harder reboot, like we gave that character the Jesse more to work on, and he kind of was able to take the ideas and implement them a little bit more. Uh, but I guess I would just say he did a better job with for that character. But a lot of the idea, initial ideas I had took over, except for the weird not shooting straight part. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there were a lot of little lessons in there that were like we really were trying to do something, and you just at some point learned that okay, this is just not working. Like I think I forget if it was Zap or some other character. I remember I had a character who had a move that would go backwards, and in the end, we just through lots of play testing and feedback, it was just like people didn't understand. Like like I'm going in one direction, and suddenly I'm going back. It was a little too. Strategic in terms of like how you want to use that game or, or uh, that move rather that ability hmm. so, I mean, but once we sort of figured it out like I think what we get to Giants and and then that point on it's sort of like okay We've gone through and made a bunch of the mistakes and and learned from them. We sort of better know What things we should be avoiding what's working what's not when it came to uh, creating Spyro um, did you take inspiration from multiple Spyro games, or did you to create his move set, or was it? Did you just focus on one game in particular? I I think I focused uh, more on the first game, but there are, I mean, I took inspirations I think from all, uh, some of them for like things like it's it's not like a direct inspiration, but he has one, that one move where he that he, he hits his head on the ground. I forget where. I got that from, but I know that it, that was very so, something very specific, and I think there's a. I want to say it's one of the um, one of the, uh, the, the the versions, the second edition versions, where he does that move with fire. And then, I mean, that wasn't that was more of just like, hey, there's this. You've seen Spyro flying around and shooting fire as well, so being able to do something like that. Um, but overall, you know, him shooting fire and like, I think we at first tried it to be more like the original one where it's just like poo, 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 and the three shots, but we eventually turned that into the upgrade uh, where he would shoot three and obviously his, his ramming was pretty straightforward in terms of that. Uh, but, uh, I don't know if that answers all your questions. Mm -hmm. So did any of the Skylanders, um, change um at all like did you originally create a move set and then just be like okay no this doesn't really work let's completely like shift that hmm. um oh man. i need i need to like look at a list here let's see if there's anything in here um oh trigger happy oh really like no he he did he did, sh he did always shoot but his secondary ability so we used to, we had this, we were experimenting with this crazy idea where at first, the very first thing we did was like, you would literally use your money as ammunition. So like you would shoot a bullet and you would lose a gold coin. And that was very quickly like, okay, this is not, this is a little bit uh, not fun to just lose your money in that way. So we got rid of that. But when that was in development, he had this sort of, weird uh, ability that essentially, I think he still has this animation where he'd spin his guns over his head and kind of do a weird dance. And it kind of made this weird maelstrom of like gold dust flying in towards him and it would pull all the coins in. So it was supposed to be this thing of like, shoot all your money out, but then use this secondary building and just get it right back. Oh, and, but you know, that's, it's kind of a more, Again, that's kind of one of those things where you're trying to figure out the DNA of Skylanders early on, and that's like, okay, that's a little too complicated of a mechanic to to put in for this game. And we really just settled in on like using primary abilities to be really just easy to use, and and then it's like, okay, 
with that ease of use ability, how do you have the secondary and tertiary abilities that can start giving you some of that more interesting complexity? Um, let me think if there are any other ones that are different. I know Whirlwind took a while to get that primary attack going. We had various versions of like these sort of like air projectiles or air bullets and whatnot. And we just couldn't really get the effects looking powerful enough where, where you know, everyone was like, oh, that looks really cool. So at some point, I believe it was Paul Ritchie who pretty much was like, he's like, this might be crazy, but I just want this character to shoot death rainbows. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna take that and run with it. And that really transformed how Whirlwind kind of you know, turned out. She always had the tornadoes, the way she would shoot on the secondary ability. Um, but yeah, definitely the rainbow thing was something that took a while before we got there. Um, let me think what else. Uh, I don't think Zap's abilities ever changed. That was just more of a visual change. Uh, oh yeah, Warnado. He, uh, he originally he originally was like supposed to be the the he was the original water dragon like so we have a dragon with each element right and he was going to be the original water dragon um, uh, and so as such it was like okay what's going to be a water projectile and I think we just had like him shooting steam out of his mouth and it would just didn't again it's one of those things where the feedback was focusing on like okay do people understand what's happening? It's just kind of this weird cloud coming out of his mouth. Uh, so that part wasn't clear and just overall, it's like, this doesn't really feel powerful because, you know, you've got this comb of steam in front of someone and it would just kind of go like, you, you want the ability to really be like, here's a, here's a projectile, it's hitting you in the face. And that was just more like doing damage over time. So it just didn't feel as good. So that's, uh, I guess, one of the other characters that went through that. That at least I think is what covers what I worked on. I'm trying to think about any of the other ones. I think, you know what, I, I oh, um, I think Dino Rang had like a few, his, his third ability took a little bit to get there. I can't quite remember what it was though. And maybe um, Double Trouble, I want to say, like it was very minor though. And he also was an old man at some point. Uh, it's actually the wizard that appears in, I think, the ice, the ice expansion. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that used to be Double Trouble's model, but then I think it was the Activision CEO who was like, "Oh man, I don't think anyone wants to play an old man." But you're wrong. I do. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing was. We were looking at them all as video game developers and like, wait, haven't you ever played Dungeons and Dragons? And he was like, no, no one wants to play an old man. He also seemed to be against green skin. So uh, that that was, I think, what prompted Boomer's appearance getting changed from, again, I guess it was like Boomer's original appearance was kind of this grumpy old troll. And he, kind of like how the enemy trolls look like. Mm. And Boomer's got like the bigger eyes and more cartoony face, so that was another one of those physical changes. Nothing in the abilities changed there. So you said that um, with some characters you was you sort of wanted to add uh, more abilities to them, um, but you were uh, restricted by the the I guess the, the amount of moves you could do. Um, were, were there any in particular you wanted to uh, add to certain? Oh, I guess just to clarify that, I was just saying I would wanted a more robust upgrade system. Oh, okay. Not necessarily move, but just a more robust upgrade system, potentially more choices, more paths to go down. But, you know, we settled with two. I believe my original spec had, like, at least four different paths you could go down. So just, you know, what's a different style? And that was just me as a designer being like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to have all these different choices that you could use to customize your character. So, uh, you know, that, that Skylander felt more like yours and, you know, you would be able to tell someone, Hey, I play, I'm playing it this way versus the other way. Cause really, you know, as it turned out, 
I know a lot of people made the videos were like, which is the path that you should take? This is the one I think is better. And with just A and B, it's kind of a little bit more of a straightforward um, question to answer, as opposed to like if you had more choices, you could be there. You know, the, at the end of the day, you really just want people to be like, this is my favorite Skylander with this build, and these are the reasons why. And then people are like, no, no, I like it this way. And you know, if you can have a fun debate about it that just means like people are really engaged in enjoying that experience with just with two you know it's harder to achieve that but that was the original intent of it so with the uh, magic items how did you decide on which items to make oh man so the the the, the magic items were pretty much i believe like iwe drew up a bunch of items and one day Somebody was like, hey, we have all these toys we're selling with the game. They need to do something. And I was just like, uh, okay. And I think the only one I was like, okay, that one seems cool. I'm going to work on that was the, the uh, it was Sparks. Mm -hmm. But all the other ones were just like, hmm, I need to do something with these because toys have appeared and we've got magic items. And when they, it was sort of like, we're going to have these as extra toys, just as an idea, but... Um, like I wasn't involved in the initial um, think tanking on that, so there wasn't like a design set forth uh, in front of me. So it's sort of like do something with these, and it's like okay, what can we do? We've got a potion that's, you know, it's a potion. So there's only so many things that we can do with that in our game. Um, you know, it, there weren't a lot of a lot of the items have specific affordances, and that you know. Potion means something should happen with that. A shield probably protects. The swords should attack things. Sparks comes with his history of things. The wing boot is, you know, there's only so much I can do with those. So it was pretty much like, okay, take these things and do what you can with them. Um, I wouldn't say that those were like the most uh, creative of, of things. But I would also say that some of those items were probably the more problematic of the development and just like issues that they would causing like definitely for sure time twisters just like in in all sorts of game development anytime you start messing with time scaling a number of things can go wrong um so you worked on the credits what uh what exactly did you do within the credits um so so at some point I forget how this went about, but they were just like, hey, we need credits. And I I essentially just was like, all right, uh, let me try doing something. And I essentially just made a, um, I made a script that uh, that ran the entire credits. So, um, so we had a, a scripting system for doing all our characters and essentially the entire game. I just made a script that would accept a bunch of text inputs and throw them up on the screen and, you know, they, they sort of come up in a way where I, I originally was inspired by the credits from The Incredibles, where they're sort of moving up with some sort of sense of 3D, um, I don't know what the... What, what the word is but like they're, they're on 3d planes so it's not just like a flat credits and at some point i believe uh terry false art director was just like hey that looks cool but i think you need a background because and you know being the artist they were just like this is interesting but it you know they want it to look really good so at that point they just started throwing all these assets at, uh, towards me and um yeah just we just kept throwing things in and more and more things. And then I think Alex Ness got involved and wrote a bunch of dialogue to go along with it. So that really I think brought a lot of charm in the credits itself. And um, yeah, so top to bottom the, for the first one, I, I scripted and got like work with the artist to pretty much do it all. It's one of those things that in game development, typically you're just cranking away in the game. And at some point, unless, you know, it's on the schedule and usually it's a video production company doing it for you. Unless it's all like planned out ahead of time. It's one of those things that people just usually forget and it's an afterthought. And then you just sort of get credits going up and they're like, okay, that's it. 
the names are there. We've completed our obligation. So it was, you know, it was fun to have something different up there. And I don't know if you, I'm pretty sure people know this, this, but at least on the Wii, um, because I had to watch the credits so many times, whenever there was a bug, I needed to be able to just uh, test it. And, and it's running for a long time. On the Wii, you can press the D-pad up and down and change the speed. Oh, really? Yeah, it shipped like that. Interesting. We were just like, this is funny, let's leave it in. Were you in charge of putting in the names, or was that someone else? Um, yeah, yeah. It was just like someone gave me a document, and I had to kind of put them into a script. And I had a... I forget how the how I scripted it, but essentially it would it would... Um, be able to, I would use some sort of code, like a, like a, like a pound sign or something, and I would be able to read how many pound signs were in it to denote, oh, there's a new section coming up. This will automatically turn it into a title, which has like a random, uh, no, not, not a random color. It would pick a random element. Mm -hmm. So like, the, the title, um, you know, like designers would, would be, would have like, say it picks the light element and then the text would be sort of in green. So that would just happen, uh, you know, every time you play the credits, I believe all the titles are randomly generated. But then under there, like it would read, okay, that's one section and it would just pull all the names and just put them in a list. And then when it found like the next pound sign, it would be like, okay, this is a new section. And I would kind of say, okay, keep switching it from left to right. And I believe that just like every new section is on, on one of the other sides. How long did it take to work on that? Oh, I don't remember. It wasn't... I don't remember it being that long because the initial script was just something that... Like, it just surprisingly came together pretty quickly. And... Um, but then... So, that part of it, I don't remember taking a uh, that long. But then I remember the production team would just come by it once in a while and be like, oh, here's some more names to throw in. And you'd have to throw them in and... or. Like, I think there was one time where it was like, okay, this is the final, final list. You got to go through and make sure everything's correct. And it's just a lot of tedious work of just checking all the names and then essentially mm -hmm. giving the list to QA and say, okay, make sure I caught everything correct. Uh, and then there was also between all of that time because I didn't really have to spend too much time on it uh, consecutively. So it was like, you know, you spend like a few hours in a week maybe looking at it, uh, maybe less. But uh the time in between was just essentially getting the artists to sort of uh, get their stuff in. Oh, I f and I, I forgot there's like a, there is sort of like a loose scripting system that changes all of the lighting as you go through uh, each thing. So we just came up with different lighting schemes and based on the timer, it would just say, okay, go to the next one, go to the next one, just so it had some visual variety. Hmm. And I think the art director essentially had to come up with uh, different lighting schemes that he was like, okay, these are the ones I like, let's use these. And you know, those were put in. Uh, so what was your favorite part of development? Uh, I mean, I got I would probably just say doing the characters. I mean, at some point, like when we were doing the upgrades, and again, going back to just figuring out that Skylander DNA, I think it was Spyro's um, Daybringer upgrade, where essentially we had talked for a long time about the last ability in your your branch needs to kind of have some sort of big wow of like, oh, you've reached the, the, the pinnacle of this character's upgrades. So prototyping that one, and while that wasn't the most spectacular of them, the sort of... Uh, mission statement there was like, okay, how do you make the most, like the ultimate form of this ability, and in Spyro's case, just a simple fireball. Um, so that was just the goal there. Um, and I think I would say in in uh, Spyro's Adventure, like Whirlwind's kind of an example of, of that one coming much later and turning like, what, like Here's the ultimate version of Whirlwind's ability, the sort of, um, I forget what the ability is called, the uh, Singularity, Rainbow Singularity or something like that, where it's just like, that was a very 
deliberately timed, super anime-esque inspired, like, crazy move where, you know, you've got the little ball and it's like, ooh, moving kind of slowly. And you're like, what's that going to be? And then it's just like, I'm going to eat everything up. And <laughs> now, the first time you see it, you might just be like, what the heck's happening? But it's also rainbows, so it's extra awesome. It is. You're not wrong. No. I, I, I do recall you are a big Whirlwind fan. Yeah, I like Whirlwind, yeah. Whirlwind was, <laughs> it was really cool. So, uh, speaking of Skylanders, which is your favorite Skylander? Um, I think I've always had a soft spot for Slam Bam. And not always. I wasn't like, I always wish he had a cooler name, although, you know, it's a, it's a decent enough name. But, um, I don't know, that, that one, that one was just, there was just something about, like, the idea of doing this ice prison ability and actually having it work out in a way where it felt really cool and strategic to use it. So you could totally, you know, use it to block projectiles and just throw one in, in front of you. Or you could trap guys, leave them alone, go somewhere else and let them un thaw out and then go hit someone other. It was like, there's, there's, it, it was a character where you can kind of use it in many ways. And I remember at one point we were testing uh, the PVP and essentially someone was using Flamesinger against me with, with Slam Bam. And it was, it, Flamesinger just is going to run away and shoot you quite a bit. He's pretty much a master at kiting. And it's, it was so hard trying to fight that person with Slam Bam. <laughs> As you can imagine, um, but it's like there's definitely a big disadvantage there. But like I wasn't just getting beaten flat out. Like it was like strategically kind of moving across the chessboard, trying to make some progress on the other guy. I think I would, you know eventually what would happen is just a, a match would time out. But you know, I do like them. There, there's always like other ones like. Boomer's just really goofy. Um, his his uh, tertiary ability was inspired from Super Bomberman, which was a game we used to play in the office quite a bit. Um, so there's just some fun connection with that character. So what would you say is the weirdest thing that happened during development? Oh, jeez. Uh, on... Okay. On any of them. On any of them? Um... Honestly, I think the one thing that comes to mind was we did this like tribute level for a it was the Make a Wish Foundation, where we had someone design a level and just it was it was both magical but also like wow this is like something that comes from like like it's not something an adult usually thinks up but it was like where you have to. Uh, escort all of the singing geckos to the Capybara King. <laughs> and just in general, you know, when I heard about this, I'm like, that's kind of cool, but also, I don't, like, what, what, where did this come from? And it just sort of appeared one day, like, I don't think I knew about it, and I was just like, oh, okay, like, did Alex write this? Uh, but no, no, then you learned the backstory, and you're like, oh, that's a really cool. So, what have you worked on since Skylanders? Um, well, after Skylanders, we did a, we, we were doing an in-house prototype for like a new game that didn't work out, and I've been working at a mobile company since then, uh, doing something that's pretty different than Skylanders, but still has a lot of hero design in it, so, you know, that's one connection, and I kind of want there because a lot of the industry is... Um, as, as a gamer, you probably see this a lot more. A lot of the game companies are trending towards doing games as services. And like, uh, I know some of that was kind of going into what Activision was looking for, for Toys for Bob. And overall, I was just like, I think for this to work out, I need to get more hands-on experience doing it from in the mobile environment where they've been doing it for like 15 plus years. So that's where, I'm, where I am now. So a company called The Young Games. We're doing a uh, it's kind of forex explore, expand, exterminate uh, 
um, I always forget the last E or X rather, and um, it's just like you you build your base up, collect heroes, and go smash enemies. And we've got uh, Sylvester Stallone as our key IP kind of character in the game. That's awesome. And, uh, finally, what advice do you have for aspiring designers? There are so many tools out there these days. You can get free versions of Visual Studio, uh, free versions of Unity, free versions of, of even like Photoshop and um, Unreal. And there's a lot of resources online for for just learning them. Really, really good YouTube channels with with stellar content. Um, if you were to like wait till I mean coming up is uh, Black Friday there are a lot of online courses you can get for really cheap like ten dollars and you know if you go through and do all the lessons there you will be able to make some form of game and pretty much game developments like you're never gonna get it right the first time uh, or it's rare that you would get it right the first time so you kinda just wanna have to have an idea of what you want to achieve and don't get too married to it. Like the best thing to do is just make a game, move on to the next one, keep making them to the, to the point where you actually have enough competence and, and confidence in your ability to make something and just say, okay, cool. Um, now, maybe now is the time that I want to start making something where I can really invest myself into it. And the other thing is like, unless you're, like some sort of programming art and design savant, you're probably going to want to find people to help you make it. So, you know, be active, reach out to the community, make friends, and, you know, or just if you've got some mates that you want to just get together and work with, that's going to work out as well. And as long as everyone's on the same page, just keep making games and get better. It's kind of like any creative form, like artists, like if you go to art school, artists aren't something that, I think it's a common misconception where people go in and, and think, oh, I need artistic talent to be a good artist. That's entirely not true. It's all about putting on a lot of hard work. Um, you essentially, like there's that kind of old adage where it's like you need to spend 10,000 hours doing one thing and then to master it. Um, Drawing is kind of a similar thing where, you know, I went to art school and one of the teachers says, you have 10,000 bad drawings in you that you need to get out before you can start really, really being like, okay, I'm, I'm just going to start cranking out all these great drawings. And it's just another way of saying, you know, you need to get good at this thing and you, it's just going to take lots of dedication and hard work. Uh, another cool way of I've heard that was like, you have a finite amount of bad drawings in you and an infinite amount of good drawings in you. So, you know, keep at it and find your way to those great drawings, or in this case, great games. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure um, talking to you uh, about your development and, and your experiences and, uh, and, and, of course, your wisdom. I, as you know, love the Skylanders franchise. Um, and it wouldn't have much. been uh, as fun of an experience uh, if it wasn't for all the work that you put in. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you for uh, playing the game. Thank you for sticking with us all the way. Thank you for enjoying it. Um, you know, it's not that often that as developers we get to interface with the fans. Usually it's like someone at a PR event and they're just trying to deliver a specific message about the game, but actually engaging with fans and being able to talk to them, I think is always a treat. You know, someone just actually saying, hey, let me acknowledge that this game was something I enjoyed. Uh, it's something that's pretty great. Mm. Also, as my last tidbit, um, if you go in Imaginators and use Hothead and use his flame ability, I think you need the infinite upgrade. You have to hold it for a really long time, and then he'll start monologuing. Oh, really? Yes. Well, that was awesome. something that was going to trap team, but it, it sort of got cut at the last minute. So I put it back in for uh, Imaginators. Oh, that's awesome. Or maybe, no, 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 maybe it's trap team. I think it's trap team. It was supposed to be in for Giants, because that's where he started. So it's in trap team, yes. Trap team. 
That's <laughs> awesome. It's just random things. And there's just actually so many little stories in there. Like, um, what's what Swarm? Originally, we wanted uh, Alessandro, the, the, the character model, to be the voice for him. But due to, I think, SAG issues, we couldn't get him in there just because I don't know if you've ever heard him before, but he's got he's an Italian guy. And he's yes, got, I actually interviewed him. I'm Swarm! <laughs> and we just were like, yes, that's exactly how he sounds. So essentially, when we did the voice recording, we're like, hey, voice actors sound exactly like this person. But... <laughs> so why, why wasn't he allowed to be the voice? Um, so when you work, like, when you work with voice actors, you have to go through the Screen Actors Guild, and essentially their, their thing is like, oh, you need to be members of the, of the guild to actually do the voices in the game. So for the first Skylanders game, essentially I believe they got, like, Errol and Alex and I think one other person, Paul, I think, they essentially got them SAG memberships to kind of get around that. But I believe they SAG was like, hey, hey, you can't give everyone a membership here just to like them in the game. But those were the ones that were, I believe, um, able to do that. Uh, Errol did a lot of the announcer voices in PvP. I don't remember what else he did. And obviously Alex did, you know, chompy mages in the first game. Nice. And, uh... He definitely, did a bunch he's of, definitely in Trap Team. I think he's also in Giants he, at some point. He did, um... Oh, what's that Mabu's name? He was always, like, get, getting blown up. Oh, okay. I think he I think he did that guy. I forget what Paul did. If, or, or Did he do something in the first one? I know he was the, the creepy dolls in the Willikins. Paul, Paul did like, those creepy voices. <laughs> Hi! Would you like to stay with us? <laughs> they were very unsettling. They were. I loved them. <laughs> yeah, that's very... I kind of wish they'd return, honestly. Yeah, it's one of those weird paw things that you're like, okay, if that's what you want, we'll, we'll do it. You're like, mm, okay, I, I see the weird charm of this. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, leave a like, subscribe, share the video around. I also have a Twitch, a Twitter, and a Patreon if you would like to support me and the channel. As you can probably tell, this is a massive passion project of mine that I've been working on for quite some time. And I'm really glad that I'm able to get it out to you, and I'm really grateful for you watching the video. If you want to see more from the series or other stuff that I do on this channel, click that notification bell to be notified when I upload next. But thank you very much for watching, I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs>